Hello, everyone, and good morning. We'll be starting shortly. Just waiting for our director, Professor Namwa Mensah, to join us so that we can start officially. So in some one or two minutes, he will be with us. Good morning, everyone. And I, you, are warm, you are warmly welcome to this morning's program. Thank you. And today we have we have a presentation on a, a very interesting topic. And I would like, Prof, to set the ball rolling. But before then, uh, the presenter for today is Dr. Richard Adai Mnunku, who will be presenting on referencing and plagiarism. In fact, he's an international man. And he's presented in several fora, including Ghana, Malawi, the US, and many other places. So he's very familiar with this particular area that he wants to handle. And I, this, this, this in research and publication, plagiarism is a, a complex and serious issue. So since time is already fast spent, I would like Prof to welcome us to the program so that Dr. Mnungu can start. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tamanja. I hope our graduate students are also online joining us. I have now. Hundred, I, hundred of us are online to, for now. Thank you. I have said time and again that these sessions for me are essential because I see the sessions as equipping our graduate students to have the needed skills and competences to conduct research and to enable them to rub shoulders with other graduate students who train anywhere. I want to add my voice, what Dr. Tamanja did say. Referencing and plagiarism are very critical when it comes to research. And let me even say this, when I saw the topic, I said, no, I wouldn't miss this because it's a learning process. So I believe all of us will get ourselves committed to this, listen attentively, and contribute so that in the end we, we would have learned. What I mean is that we would have added knowledge to what we already have. So on that note, I say a big thank you to Dr. Adam Nunkrum for having agreed to treat this important topic. Dr. Adam Nunkrum, we are most grateful. Now Dr. Tabanja, you can now take off. Let us take off, please. So, Dr. Adai Munuk, we can, the, the policy in your court, your audience are listening and waiting curiously to hear from you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kankam, uh, my, my yeah. mentor number one. <laughs> and Dr. Tamanja, um, a colleague who has been doing so well at IRIS. And I'm very thankful to the whole IRIS team for putting this together. Uh, for some of us, uh, we couldn't have done our graduate work without such opportunities like these. And that is why I felt very excited when I heard about it and I was approached to come and then support it. And so I'm very excited to see a number of graduate students here. I think I'm seeing 102 participants, which 102. is very good. Yes. So, yes. so I want to welcome all of you um, I know some of you are not graduate students. I'm seeing some of my colleagues here, and that should tell you the students that it's not just uh, students that are interested. Um, academics, every academic is interested in this particular topic. And so um, we have to be very serious about learning more about it. Um, Dr. Tamanja was kind enough to say so much about me, but I don't want to see myself as the expert here, uh, but I want to be a facilitator. Uh, who is going to help us all learn uh, about plagiarism. Uh, so I have, I have a slide I'm going to share, and then um, when it becomes necessary, I'm going to drop the slide and then do some demonstration depend, because of how I want the session to go. So um, I believe all of us are ready, so we're just going to get started. Um, so I want to start with this um, 
a story that, that made the news not long ago, just about two weeks ago. Um, one of my favorite hit life songs, uh, which is called Open Gate. I think a lot of you also relate to that. It's a very popular high life song sung by uh, Kwame Eugene, who is a, a famous musician now, a very young famous musician. Um, after enjoying the song for some time, this news dropped that somebody is accusing Kwame uh, Eugene of stealing some parts of the letters to the song. And interestingly, it's my favorite part, which kind of doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. Uh, the part that it was stolen is, is the part that goes Wele, Sebe, Kunto, Miri. There's a rhyme to it, which, which adds to the, the, the beauty of the song. Um, and so a lot of us have been singing and dancing to this song, uh, but a guy by name Raphael is saying, uh, actually, that those three words were his words that Kwame Eugene stole. He is promising to take it to court. We we'll, we'll wait to see how, how far he's able to go with it. But the issue of plagiarism is not just an academic thing. Uh, periodically, you hear in, in other sectors, people accusing others, especially in the creative arts industry, uh, people being accused of uh, stealing uh, something related to intellectual property of, or something of that sort. Uh, so it is very important for us as academics because it's, it can make and make you. Plagiarism can make you if, if you take the least chances. And so um, this is how I'm going to uh, do the presentation. We're going to talk briefly about what plagiarism is, its actual nature, what constitutes plagiarism, what is not plagiarism, um, we also want to look at how bad it can be. Like a lot of people take it lightly and say, oh, it's, I just missed four references. Uh, is it that bad? We'll look at that. Um, we also want to look at why people plagiarize and then see how we can avoid plagiarism. And at this point, I am very interested in this part um, where I'm going to do a demonstration with technology. Now, technology is aiding us so much. And in the issue of avoiding plagiarism, I think uh, technology is one sure way to go. Um, I was fortunate to be part of last week's session where somebody asked um, when we are going to teach some of these technological tools. And I'm very happy to introduce it to, to you um, at that point. So I'm going to start with the first part of the presentation. And when I get to the last part, I'm going to take the slide off and then show how technological tools can help us to avoid plagiarism. So what is plagiarism? And I always want to sound a note of caution. If you come from where I come from, then you have to be careful when you're pronouncing plagiarism. Uh, it's kind of mouthful with L and the R, and it, it, it's quite challenging. Um, plagiarism is as simple as taking somebody's ideas and words and making it your own. It's literally that. Um, APA is quite diplomatic in, in defining it as um, presenting the words or ideas of another as your own. But if you read the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says it's an act of fraud. And you know how serious fraud is. It is stealing, literally, according to Merriam-Webster um, dictionary where you steal somebody's idea and try to make it your own. Um, somebody made a remark that we all eat by what we know. Um, I'm translating it literally. Uh, if, you are, if, you are, if you are an Akan, you understand it. So it is what we know that we gives us a, a, what, a living. And if I'm surviving on what I know and you take it away and try to make it your own, then you are stealing from me. And that is why somebody is accusing Kwame uh, Eugene of stealing uh, Wile Sebe Kuntomiri, uh, which kind of, there are words that do not make sense, but the person has seen that Kwame Eugene is making money out of it. And so he's accusing him literally of stealing, going by this definition. Um, we can break it down in this form. You are plagiarizing when you use another person's work without crediting the source. Um, the accounts will say, Nyan Stendi Bako Foti. Certainly, you might have gotten an idea from somewhere. 
There is no problem with that. But the moment you put it in your work and you don't acknowledge the source, then you are plagiarizing. You are also plagiarizing when you present an idea as original, when in fact it is not, and you got it from somewhere. If you read it from a book, if somebody told you, if, if you got the idea from somewhere, and then you present it as if it is your own idea that you're bringing, and you're presenting it as an original idea, then you're plagiarizing. If you plagiarize, you are committing literary thefts. I'm using literary because mostly in academia, it's more about the writing. That is where the issue comes up. So you put it in your work, you have stolen somebody's uh, writing. And so it is theft. And it means to steal or pass off the idea as your own, as I've already explained. And so um, I'm going to give some specifics about, about what constitutes plagiarism. First, let's talk about this idea of grandfatherism. Uh, I think almost every graduate student have heard this term grandfather. Students, graduate students, and some undergraduate students, I should believe it should be more of undergraduate students and less of graduate students. Um, when they are supposed to write their project work, their dissertations or their thesis, they just go and dig through the archives. Go to UCC if they are at UUW, go to the library, Take somebody's dissertation that was presented like 1976, thereabouts, because it's been a long time ago, and then try to copy and present it as their work. That is grandfather. That's the term that is, is used to refer to that. So I'm, I'm relying on my grandfather's work. Um, if you turn in somebody else's work as your own, you are committing plagiarism. So perhaps it's the, the highest order of plagiarism where you actually take a whole bulk of um, writing and then put your name on it and then present it. Uh, back in the day, we know some of our colleagues who were doing that, even in uh, uh, assignments that we were asked to submit. You write your assignment and they are able to get hold of it. They just clean off your name, write your name and then present it. That is perhaps the highest form of plagiarism. You are taking somebody's property. Um, so grandfather is plagiarism at the highest, of the highest order, I should say. Um, another way you plagiarize is to copy ideas from someone without giving credit. So if you get the idea from somebody, um, you had an interaction with the professor can come and then he sold an idea to you in your writing and then you just make it like your own, then you are plagiarizing. Failing to put quotation marks where it is due is also plagiarizing. A lot of us lose sight of this fact. Quotation marks are important for a reason. The moment you put quotation marks, you mean this is a verbatim quote from the source I got. If you don't put the quotation marks, it means I am paraphrasing this idea from that person. So if you're directly quoting from a source and then you make it look like you're paraphrasing, you are still plagiarizing because you are making the idea seem like your own. You're making it look like you've adapted it, whereas it is a direct quotation. And so failing to put quotation marks um, where it is due is also plagiarism. Giving incorrect information about the source of a quotation, and a lot of students fall foul to this one. They put the citation in the text, in text citation as um, Anochi 2020. And then you go to the reference and it is Anochi 2012. This is incorrect information about the source. That is also plagiarism. And not long ago, about two weeks ago, I sat in a viva where somebody was failed because of this. Um, and, and we saw that it was deliberate. Um, in all the interest citations, the dates were like plus 10 years compared to what was showing in the reference. Apparently, he had done this literature review and then the supervisor said, no, all your, your literature is outdated. They are old, you're quoting 1976 and stuff like that. And we want current literature. So go and update your work with current literature. And the guy thought he was smart. So he just went, 
did not do anything, but he changed all the interest citations by adding plus 10 years to make it newer. So when you look at the interest citation, if it's uh, Mensa 2010, then you make it Mensa 2020. And so it, when you read the text, it looks very current, but when you go to the reference, it's very outdated. And we found out, and then he was failed for doing this. Otherwise, the work was excellent, but for giving incorrect information about the source of the quotation, um, he was failed, and that is also plagiarism. Sometimes people also get the sentence structure, the main idea is there, but they change few words and let it pass off like it is their own, whereas it is not their own. And so they fail to acknowledge any source. They just change a few words, maintain the main idea and the structure of the sentence, and then they fail to acknowledge any source. So when you're reading, you might think it is their own, but invariably it is not. That is also plagiarism. And the last I will mention here is copying so many words and ideas from a source that it makes up the majority of your work. And we also see this a lot in a lot of students' writing, where they read somebody's work and it looks like the work is very close to what they are intending to do. So they literally copy everything there. They do acknowledge the source all right, but then you realize that majority of the entire page is somebody's work. If you're doing that, you're still plagiarizing, although you might have acknowledged the source. And you see this a lot in literature review. You read like three pages of literature review and it's only one source that has been cited all through. So the first paragraph, the same source is there, second paragraph, third paragraph, all through like three pages. This is still plagiarism because you are copying so much from one particular source that we even doubt if your own idea is there at some point. And so that is also a form of plagiarism. How bad can plagiarism be? Plagiarism can be very embarrassing. It can be very embarrassing, and I'm going to tell you some stories about that. Um, the first man called Alex Halley is an American author who gained fame uh, by writing a popular book called Roots, the Saga of the American Family. It was a, a book related to slave trade, um, and it was so popular and highly subscribed. And so a lot of people bought the book, only to be told, the book was published in 1976. In 1978, another man by name Harold Cullen came in and said that part of the book had been plagiarized from his original book, The African. So this man who had gotten so famous, Harley, who had gotten so famous, had to go for out of court settlement, which costed him $650,000. And you can imagine how much that money is in Ghana cities. Um, apart from the money that he paid, it has become a dent on his record. If you Google right now, Alex Halley, what you will come is not his contribution to knowledge, but what will come was his plagiarism, which is very embarrassing. Matthew Whitaker is a professor at Arizona State University in the US. And he has been demoted because of plagiarism. He wrote a book, Peace Be Still, in 2014. Um, and the book was about history of America from World War II to Obama, which was also a very popular book. Later, it emerged that parts of the book had been plagiarized. And when it became obvious, the university took took a decision to demote him from a present rank as a professor to a lower rank. And if you were teaching at a university and this should happen to you, you can imagine how terrible you're going to feel. Quite close to us, in 2006, the current minority leader, Honorable Haruna Idrisu, had his whole Enfield degree revoked by the Academic Board of the University of Ghana when it came up that some parts of the Enfield thesis he had presented were plagiarized. So 
plagiarism is not only checked when you're defending your work or when your work goes for external or whatever supervision. Even after you have graduated, if we have evidence that the work was plagiarized, the university deserves the right to actually withdraw the certificate that we have issued to you. And I'm glad the Dean of Graduate Students is here. Dean of Graduate to School of Graduate Studies is here. Maybe we'll begin to uh, crack the whip on this one and try to identify those who have been plagiarized and try to withdraw yeah. um, their certificates <laughs> so that people see how serious it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and perhaps the most embarrassing one that we are all familiar with was the um, famous inaugural address of our president um, in 2017, when parts of it were seen to have been plagiarized from uh, the speeches of Bill Clinton and George Bush. I think this is quite recent. And you saw all the, uh, the embarrassment that it caused, not just the presidency, but, but the entire country, because the news got as far as Al Jazeera and international media, and it, it was very embarrassing uh, because parts of the speech had been said by um, Clinton and Bush, and all we could have done was just to acknowledge that this part is from uh, Clinton and Bush, but unfortunately the speech writers let our president down and it caused us a great embarrassment. So plagiarism should not be taken lightly. It is so bad. It is so bad because it is theft. It is stealing. It is just like going to somebody's shop, breaking into it and taking somebody's property away. Because if somebody survives on something they know and you take it away and make it your own, you're stealing their intellectual property. Plagiarism is cheating. By plagiarizing, you are unfairly benefiting by gaining a qualification you have not worked for. If you go to take somebody's grandfather, take a grandfather and copy and present it, and for that reason you are awarded a PhD or an MPhil or an MED, you are cheating. You are cheating everybody by making us believe that you worked for it and giving you the certificate, whereas you did not actually put in any work in that regard. Plagiarism raises doubt about your other works. It could have just been one instance of plagiarism but it calls to question your credibility for every other thing that you have written. And especially for those of us in academia, this is how bad it can be for us. You might have written tons of tons of papers and books and whatever, none of them might have been plagiarized. But if you just get one instance of plagiarism which goes on your record, nobody trusts you again. And so when you are reading any other material that you wrote, we are always thinking perhaps you might have plagiarized. And so nobody will take you serious, which is how bad plagiarism uh, can be. And it is also bad because it uh, deceives unsuspecting readers. People are reading the work and thinking it is you, whereas the work is actually not you. And that is why it is bad. It is deception, it is cheating, and it is theft. And that is why academics don't take kindly to it. Whenever it comes up, we, we give it, a, we treat it with all the, the standards that it deserves because um, it is bad, it is theft, and it is cheating. And academia is an honorable society that we wouldn't want to uh, encourage people who are cheats to be riding on the, web, on the backs of other people. So why would people plagiarize if it is this bad? I, I have categorized why people plagiarize into two. There are intentional plagiarism and there are unintentional plagiarism. So let me take the intentional plagiarism. The people intentionally plagiarize um, because they are lazy. Instead of doing what is required of them to get the certificate that they deserve, or instead of doing what is required, doing the hard work to write an article for publication, to write a dissertation, to write a project work or a thesis, they are too lazy to do that. And so they think the easiest way out is just to copy somebody's work and turn it in. So lazy is one of the reasons why people intentionally plagiarize. Other people want to be famous. They've seen this big idea and they want to be associated with that big idea. And so they just want to pass it off as them. The moment you put it in, in your work, people begin to cite you. 
And a friend of mine said that in academia, the greatest honor is to be, is to be cited. When people read your work and they feel it is important and they cite you and your Google Scholar Index is going up and then you're becoming famous, you're so happy because people are citing your work and they are finding value in your work. Some people, because they want to get there, then they want to put people's ideas at their own so that they will get cited. And so the quest for fame will drive people to intentionally plagiarize. Other people procrastinate, and we see this a lot with students. They have a one-year period to write their MPhil thesis, and they keep procrastinating. So I'll start next month, in two months, in three months until they are told that you have a three month deadline in which to present your work. And then they are so quick to just put something together and present it because they are avoiding pay payment of fees. Um, and so procrastination has been seen to be one of the reasons why people plagiarize. And last but not least of the intentional plagiarism that I'll talk about is people with low self-esteem. There are some people who plagiarize because they don't trust in their own abilities. They are always thinking, um, I don't think I can do it. Everybody else is smarter than me. And so I need to write somebody's work because I can't do it by myself. If you couldn't do it, we wouldn't have admitted you. Before you admitted, we weighed the options. We looked at your potential and we felt that you can do it. But people come in and surprisingly, I don't know whether uh, other people fear, scare them away. Uh, they just relax and say, no, no, this one I've heard is too hard. I can't do it. And we see this a lot with our, our MED students. Um, a lot of people have been telling them they can't do it. If you couldn't do it, we wouldn't have admitted you. And so people with so self, low self-esteem uh, will intentionally plagiarize because they think they can't do it by themselves. But I want to assure you that everybody who has been admitted has the potential. The fact that somebody else was able to do it means you can also do it. So instead of plagiarizing somebody's work, maybe you should do an original work and, and hope that somebody will plagiarize. We don't wish for that to happen, but uh, believe in yourself. There are others who also plagiarize unintentionally. And this is where it feels so bad when it comes out. And it happens to a lot of people in academia. Unintentional plagiarism can ha happen sometimes because people are ignorant. They are ignorant about referencing and what they need to reference and what they do not need to reference. And so because they do not know, they allow certain loose ends to remain loose. And for that reason, it comes up as, as plagiarism. So sometimes it's for sheer ignorance. They don't know how to do inter-citation or they don't know how to uh, put footnotes and all of that. And so by sheer ignorance, people play, plagiarize. That is not to say if you do it unintentionally, you still not be punished. You will be punished in a way. And so we have to find a way of avoiding it. There is another reason I call editing rules. And by editing rules, I mean where people write their work, put in all the citations and put in all the references. And at some point they go in there to re revise the work. Maybe it goes for assessment and it comes back and then they are supposed to make some modification to parts of the work. In making modification to parts of the work, they probably forget to acknowledge a source or they delete a citation, which originally was was there but they keep the reference or they delete the reference and then forget to keep the citation in there and so when you are editing and you're not very careful you can learn into this prob problem of plagiarism because you might have mistakenly deleted something um, which then will give cause to um, the concern that you might have plagiarized uh, the work so that is unintentional but it's still punishable in a way and the last I will mention is that referencing can get overwhelming sometimes. If you're writing a thesis or dissertation, and especially the PhD students who are writing theses to the tune of 300 pages and the likes, you're talking about volumes of references, volumes of references, and sometimes it gets so overwhelming that you lose track. You, you, you just can't cope with it anymore because it's so much. 
that you are likely to slip with a few of them because the work you're doing is overwhelming. Um, it can be understandable, it's human, but it still doesn't take away the fact that it is plagiarism. When you're found out, you will still be punished for doing that. And so whether intentional or unintentional, plagiarism is that bad. And everybody in academia ought to try to run away from, from it. So how can we avoid plagiarism? One, I say create your own idea and use secondary sources to corroborate. A lot of students, when you read their writings, it feels like they have no idea of their own because they are always referencing. Right from the very first line of the dissertation, they start referencing people. So you read a whole page, two pages, and you don't see where their idea is. If you start writing by referencing people, chances are that you are going to miss out. But if you put your idea first, and then you use references, other people's work to back your idea, then you are likely to have less references and you are likely to, to, to avoid plagiarizing. So try to create your own idea a lot of times and use secondary sources as, um, to corroborate your, your work. Especially when you're reading chapter three, the methodology, everything seems to be like according to somebody. And it feels so boring to read right from the start. Um, research design, and they start research design according to social and so is this. Um, research approach according to social and so is this. Uh, qualitative research according to this is social and so. We want to hear your voice to begin with. I am approaching this work as a qualitative researcher. That is what I want to read first. I'm doing this because this work gives credence to qualitative research, which has been explained to be this, 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 this. And you acknowledge the source. If you're bringing your idea first, then you're not going to forget somebody's citation that you just added to your idea. But if everything is somebody's idea, then you're likely to forget. Cite the sources as soon as you write down the idea. This is very helpful because you are reading so much to write your dissertation and thesis. And so once you get an idea that you think will be useful for your work, the moment you add that idea to your work, write the source. Don't wait until you have finished every writing before you go to the reference session and then, and then start writing. You are likely to forget where you actually got the idea and that might, that might go to hurt you. So as soon as you put somebody's idea there, indicate the source right away so that you don't forget. And then I will say, go to the reference session and then add the reference to that. Because building a reference list is not the end of the process thing to do. It is an iterative process. So in writing, as you write, you build your reference list. You don't finish writing everything before you go and then start building your reference list. A lot of students think, it, think of it that way because the reference list is always at the end. And so they want to finish the chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, all the chapters, and then they spend time to sit down and then write the, the reference list. If you do that by the time you get there, you might have forgotten the source of some of the citations you've already made, and that will create problems uh, for you. So, so you, you cite the source, go and add it to your reference. Cite the source, go and add it to your reference. You delete the source, go back to your reference, and then delete it from there. Consult appropriate referencing guide. It's also very important to do that. My audio. Uh-oh. Hello. Yeah, your, your, uh, audio, your, your audio is on, so go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Consult appropriate referencing guide. Um, there are different forms of referencing, different referencing styles. Here in Mr. J, well, we go by AQ, the reference style of the American Psychological Association. That's the most popular. A lot of academic writing rely on AQ. But in some instances, some places require MLA, Chicago style, Harvard, Vancouver, and the rest. Wherever you're writing to, be sure to know the style that they are expecting you to, to use. 
And as you try to build your reference, consult the reference guide. If you just Google APA style or APS formatting, you're likely to get um, some direction on that. In fact, APA.org will be your start, starting point. Just go there and they will tell you how to reference every source of information uh, that you get. But thanks to technology, we have moved to a point where technology is traditionally. One, there are plagiarism checkers. There are now software that will check. Um, We're on avoiding plagiarism. So some to say from the yeah. third and third and fourth. But I, I did mention that you can avoid plagiarism one either by doing a plagiarism check with, with relevant software after the work has been written. And I mentioned a couple of um, plagiarism software uh, detectives. Um, I hope I got that part. So I was just at the point of introducing uh, how uh, reference managers can work. And by reference managers, these are software that helps you to manage all your references in one location so that when you cite, you don't forget and um, you are able to reference appropriately. So I want to demonstrate how that is going to be uh, just a moment. So for, for this part, I was actually hoping that um, when we were planning this seminar, we were thinking it will be face to face. And so I could organize a workshop kind of thing where we do a hands on activity with this. Um, but since we're doing it virtually, we cannot do that hands on activity. And so I'm going to try to um, demonstrate how it works and then direct you on how you can get it started. And I will also give you some links on useful YouTube videos that you can actually consult to direct you on how to do it. The students are suggesting if you can go over the, the, the plagiarism checkers again. Yes, the plagiarism checkers, yes. Um, there are, the most popular one is turn it in. Turn it in, just the way you spell it, turn it in. Um, is the most popular. We have one called copy leaks, copy leaks. Um, and there is a pro detector. Pro detector is another. Um, and then plagiarism checker X is also another. Let me let me exit and get back on because I it's, it's quite strange. I have the files and they are just not showing for me. Uh, okay, can can we see a word document open? Yes, chapter one, introduction. Okay, okay, good, perfect. So at least we now can continue. Um, so what I'm going to do is to demonstrate how the uh, software works and how it helps to avoid um, missing citations. And basically it, it helps you to do your references and makes you do it easily without having to memorize all the rules with APA and stuff like that. So this is somebody's work that I just picked from here. Um, it's one of my students and I won't mention the name. I'm not plagiarizing though, but I'm just using it for demonstration. Um, so this is her work and you can see right from the very first sentence, supervision is essentially the practice of monitoring the performance of two staff, noting marriage, merit, uh, blah, 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 all the way. Um, I am suspecting that this sentence is actually from somebody. Um, I won't go into why I think so, and I think a lot of the academics will, will agree with me. Um, I don't believe this is the student's own work, uh, but that is a conversation I'll have with, with him or her. Uh, but I just want to use it to demonstrate. So assuming this was from a source that was not acknowledged, I'm going to show how I can add a citation to this work and make my work easier when I'm building my references. So I'm going to insert a citation here. 
I'm using a reference manager called Zotero. Um, I'm doing the, the demonstration from the back end. I'm showing how it works. And then later I'll build you up to know how I was able to get to where I am starting from. So don't get worried. I know you have many questions about how do they come and all of that, but it will get better as we move. So I'm going to insert a citation here because I suspect this whole sentence might have been from somebody. I have my suspicion. So I'm going to engage my reference manager called Zotero. You see that in my Word document over here in the tab, there's a tab called Zotero. So I have activated it and I'm going to insert a citation. So I am going to type in, um, this is about supervision. So I'm going to try to use one of my references on supervision just for demonstration purposes. And I'm going to put it there. Now, this is how you're supposed to cite by APA if you're, if you're citing a source. So you realize that Shenge and Seyomwene has shown up as the reference for that one. We are assuming that that is the source where the person got this information from. I can add a couple more sources. Well, this one, the acknowledge the source, I'm just going to delete and I'm going to put a different source there just for demonstration purposes. So I'm going to add another citation. Let me say this uh, source is coming from, um, who else? Akwe, because I know my friend Akwe is here. So I'm just going to pick one of her works. Oh, did I say Aqua? Okay, let's just do that. Uh, Aqua, um, he cited something from Manco. Um, I'm going to change that and put somebody else's citation there. Um, let me now do Akwe because Akwe is here. <laughs> uh, Akwe, okay. Um, don't worry, I'll teach you how I, I, I got to do what I'm doing. I just want to show you something briefly before we move on. Um, so I have put a year there. You see that in this one, the reference, the name of the author is part of the sentence. And so when the name of the author is part of the sentence, it doesn't go in the bracket. The name stands outside of the bracket and then you keep only the year in the bracket. Compared to the previous one where the name is not part of the sentence, you see that the name and the year is in the bracket. Um, so I have these three citations done in my work. I'm going to build a reference. Um, reference list based on what I have written so far. Traditionally, you now have to go to each one of the authors and then do the referencing and do it appropriately. But with technology, it is just a click of the button and that is what I'm going to do. So all I need to do is to add bibliography. Uh -oh. Okay. Technologies field. Okay, finally it came. Good. So look at what we did. We added some citations that have shown up as reference. So you remember we added Shenge and Sunyomwini, we added Aqua, and we added um, Manko 2018. Manko was actually supposed to be Aqua. So I'm just going to change that one to Aqua. Yeah, now when you come to the reference list, it has been built automatically for you because you have added them there. Because I'm using a reference manager. Let me just add one more. Maybe assuming these citations were of, uh, for a different person. Let me just add a couple more citations. Um, let me add myself over here. Let me add uh, my good friend, Patricia Amos. Uh, let me add my lab. Uh, whatever. Okay. So uh, I can't believe that the reference has been updated. The reference list has been updated. Now, the most important thing 
is that I can change the format of this reference. Right now, it's not APA, it's something else. On, but it was breaking. Yes, it was breaking. It was breaking, yes. Is it, is it better now? Yes, yes. better now. Okay, better okay, now. great. Good. So, what the uh, reference manager does for you is that it keeps all your references intact. And as you write your work and you add the references, it builds your, your reference list for you. So you don't have to wait till the last end. And the good thing is that you are not going to miss any reference if you're using this. Because the moment you add it, it automatically builds it up. Let me try to delete a couple of them. So I'm going it to have, delete it the same. The students are complaining that some of them cannot see the screen. Oh, is that so? But I can, but, but I can see it from here. You can see it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm doing anything wrong, but if you're seeing, then they should also see. Um, so they should try. Maybe they should log back uh, in. Some of them, some of them say they can. Some of them say they can also see. So let's continue. Okay. Okay. Good. So now there is this reference. Assuming at some point we decided this part of the dissertation is not important, so we're deleting it. We we'll just delete this whole section because that's where the idea is coming from. And then go to my reference list. You see that the reference Chenge and Sinyamwini, which was here, um, is still there, but I can refresh and take it off. So I just refresh my, my list and then Chenge and Sinyamwini is gone because it is, it is linked automatically. Um, now, the other advantage of using such tools is that sometimes you write a work in the APA and then you are told, uh, present it in another style. It means you have to spend man hours trying to convert your APA format into something else. Now, with this, it is very, very simple to do. I just come back to my reference manager and change the reference list. So I will go to my document preferences and try to change from one format to another format. So let me see how it goes with this one. Okay. So now the dialog box that comes shows that this is APA 7. Uh, assuming I want to change it to Chicago. Let me see. Uh, which one? Okay. Let me do Chicago style. That might not be too radical. Let me do Vancouver. Vancouver is totally different. So I change my reference to Vancouver style. And then automatically changes. This is how Vancouver reference is done. Totally different. It goes by numbering. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the moment I I noticed or I was told that they don't use APA and they use Vancouver, I just automatically um, change it and then I don't have to spend man hours doing all this. And so the reference manager helps a lot. I can revert back to APA. Let me go back to APA, which is, and it's been updated to the seventh edition. Um, yes, good. And then I get it my APA way, the way I want it. So this is how easy a reference manager can work, make your work become. Um, you don't have to stress. You don't have to think about missing a reference. You don't have to worry about missing a reference. Um, it's just a matter of building up all your references and then calling them when you need them. Now, let me quickly show how I got to this point. Now, at this point, I've already built a database of my references, and that is why I am able to just bring it up and then it shows up. Um, to build your own um, database, I want to show you my database. Uh, let me, Dr. Tamanja, are you seeing a box with Zotero? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is my database of all the references I have, right from the time I was writing my PhD dissertation. 
everything as reference is here. And you can see it's a uh, 1,039 items and still counting. Anytime I read and get a source, I just come and add it to my library. And that is why I have all these references here that I can always fall upon whenever I'm writing. Um, it's not exhaustive. So when I ask, ask and when I find new ideas, when I find new writings, I come and then add them to my, my references. The cool thing is you can actually create folders within. It just work like your, your own laptop and where you're organizing your materials, put them in different um, uh, folders and, and all of that. So if you're writing a paper and you want all the sources to be put in one folder, you just create a folder and then put all your sources over there. Um, but invariably all of them will show up in your library. So how did I add the, the references to the library? And it's also as simple as I can show you. Um, so let me go to my browser. And I believe by now all of us are familiar with Google Scholar. Um, if you are not, um, whenever you are searching for academic writing from the internet, don't go straight to Google. Go to Google Scholar and try to get academic writing from there. So I'm at scholar.google. And I'm going to search for uh, plagiarism, maybe. Um, let me see if there are some articles on plagiarism. OK. So I see this one, plagiarism, a survey by uh, Mora and whatever. Now, there are ways I can add this to my, um, to my library. Uh, just a moment, let me clear off this. Let me clear off this browser and then use the browser that is configured for this one. So I'm just changing, I'm just changing my browser to another one that has this configured. So this will make it's a bit challenging. Okay, so it's still my Google. Let me go to Scholar now, and then and the internet is slow. Sorry about that. So what I'm trying to demonstrate is how you can actually just get something online and then save it in your in your database of references so that when you want to retrieve it is very easy for you to do that that is what i'm trying to demonstrate so i'm trying to call scholar and then try to search okay so scholar is here um and i am reading something on plagiarism so i'm just going to plagiarism and i'm going to search on that good so i have this one plagiarism a survey now, if I want to add this to my library, and this is the library I showed you. It is here as Zotero library. Um, all that I need to do is to search for this document. And here you have it as PDF. So assuming I've gotten it, I've read it already. I want to save it to my library. I just go here because I've already configured it. Um, click on this folder and then it gives me the item I want to save in my library, I click on plagiarism, a survey, and then click on OK. And it is going to extract all the details, the author, the publisher, the, the source, and everything into my library so that I don't have to worry about going to check and, and doing all that. So it is, you can see that it is saving to my library. Um, it's an error, error, OK, OK, let me see if it works. It didn't work. Okay. Let me try once more. The technology is trying to disappoint me. Let me try this one. Um, that's the second, the second article. Let me see if it works. Save into the library. Uh oh. What is happening with me and my machines? Okay. Let me refresh and then try again. So 
because it should work easily. So let me try this one. You can actually select multiple um, sources. Anything showing here will show. Uh, let me hope that it works this time. Okay, good, it has. So this one, intrinsic plagiarism detection. You see that it has come in here and showing in my library. Uh, I hope we can see. Dr. Tamanja, can you see? Now I'm relying on you for the feedback. <laughs> yes, um, I, can, I, I can see. <laughs> okay, good. We so you see. see that, yes, maybe it was working the first time. So it has actually saved two times. So I'm just yes. going to delete one of them. Um, yes. So you can see from the right side, all the details of the, the reference is there. It is a conference paper. This is the title. These are the authors. This is the year. Uh, this is the proceedings of the conference. The publisher is here, the pages are there. So it has saved every little detail about the work. And so when I go back to my reference and I'm adding it, it will come. Um, let me, okay, so their name is Zoo, Zoo something something. Let me go back to my work. Assuming I'm going to add it as a reference here, I just do, add a citation, and I'm going to add them as a zoo something something. I don't recall the name. The net is also not. It's not helping, yeah. Yeah. It, it's network, a bit slow. Network is poor today. The network is yeah. poor. Okay, good. So it has come. Zoo Asian, oh, it's not Asian, it's Asian. No. <laughs> I thought it was a Ghanaian. So because I've added it to my reference, you see it has shown up over here. So I just add it to my citation. Yes, so you see it's Zoo, Asian and Stain. And let me come to my reference list. You see that automatically it is there. So I don't have to worry at all about it anymore. Um, let me just show one cool feature before I wrap up on this one because I'm taking too much time. Um, so the cool thing is that this can actually become your note-taking um, uh, reference source. With this particular reference, you can add notes to it. So if you read something that is so keen, um, that you are so keen about, you can actually put it down as a note so that you remember when you are searching for material. So you just come up here. I have selected the reference. I have clicked on notes. I'm going to add notes to it. And then it should give me like a web page and then I can type my notes in there. The machine is not minding me. You can also add a tag to it. Tags are just quick identifiers. They are words or phrases that will make you easily um, identify that. And so we know this is a plagiarism. So I can just add a tag. I can just add a tag plagiarism. Um, and then I add, I can add another tag as in uh, um, just just for, for elaboration sake, let me just add my name as a tag. I'm just going to show how it works so that, good. Now, you've, once you've added tags to a reference, you can easily search for it when you're writing on the subject because sometimes you read something that you might not even reference it until years later. But once you have put the relevant tags and notes in there, when you have forgotten about that work, you just have to come to your library and then come to the field where you can search. So I'm just going to search um, plagiarism in my, in my library. And I expect that it will pull up this particular reference because I had already tagged it as plagiarism. And the system is slow. Um, it's not coming up. Um, yeah, so pretty much 
your reference manager should be your 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 guide more or less if you if you are a graduate student depending on the level the, the level you are at and um what you've been doing with your work you need to get a reference manager of some sort and i am recommending zotero for you there are a couple of others there's mendley and there are a couple of others i'm recommending zotero because it's free and i know a lot of you will ask yes it is free to download and quickly i'm going to show you maybe i should do that before we run out of time so let me just um leave my reference manager and then come to continue and wrap up with my slide so you can you can get access to zotero for free and this is how you can you can get it uh -oh. i did not mean to start from this right okay so let me start again. To get Zotero, all you need to do is just to go online to zotero.org. Z-O-T-E-R-O, zotero.org. Um, and once you go there, you can create an account, you can download it. Um, I know some of you also ask whether it is internet based. No, Zotero, it's, well, it works both ways. There's an internet side of it and there's a, a, a manual side of it where you don't need an internet. So I can still access my Zotero library even when I'm offline. And anytime I go online, it updates. So the account that is created for you um, stays online and Anytime you want to access it, you'll be able to access it from every location. So to get access to it, just go to zotero.org. And I know my presentation was not very exhaustive. I got disrupted and it didn't come as smoothly as I wanted. But there's actually a YouTube link where you can watch how you can set it up for, you, for, your, for yourself, how you can get it on your laptop and then set it up. So I've also provided a YouTube link over there, as you can see. Um, and this is how you, you go through, you create an account online. When you go to zotero.org, you can register your account once you have any valid, uh, what do you call it? valid um, email address, you can create your own account and then you download the software onto your computer. So what I was using is actually what I have downloaded on my computer. Then once you have downloaded, you also go and merge what you have downloaded with your online account. So that when you do any update on your computer, automatically it updates online whenever you connect. And the usefulness of that is that you never lose your data. So even if this computer is stolen, I still have all my references intact because I can always access it online. And anytime I download on a new machine, all I need to do is to link it to the online account and then I can be able to use it there as well. Um, once that standalone has been merged with the online version, then you download a plugin browser, a, a browser plugin, I should say. Um, there's a, a part that connects to your internet browser, whether you're using uh, Chrome or using Firefox. It doesn't work well with in, Internet Explorer, so I wouldn't advise that. But if you're using Microsoft, uh, uh, Google Chrome, it works perfectly. And that's what I use. Uh, there's a, a part of it that you download. It's just a few steps you click download and then it gets installed in your browser so that when you're searching for something, it can connect it and then download to your library. And sometimes it doesn't work smoothly with Microsoft Word, but if it's working fine, the moment you download the Zotero standalone, it, the components also download onto your Microsoft Word. So when I go to Microsoft Word, you see that I had a tab named Zotero. Once you finish your download, this tab should be attached to your, your Microsoft Word document. If it doesn't, there's still a way to do it. And I have a link provided there for you to be able to do that. Um, so that is how 
you can you can download and install Zotero for yourself. I would strongly advise that you go to YouTube, read, watch a lot of videos. There are a lot of demonstration videos there that will help you. Um, my my slide has it's not responding. Let me restart it. There are a lot of videos that will help you. You can just watch them and then by yourself, um, you'll be able to do it. If you're a tech savvy, you'll be able to do it. If you're not so tech savvy, it might just take a couple of times. Um, you will be able to do it. And my advice is that if you're, if you're very early in your program, your PhD and Phil, this is the time to do this because you begin to read a lot of literature. And as you read, you need to create your own library. And as you create your own library, by the time you write your dissertation, you already have read a lot and you have references for all of them. If you're very late in your work and your work is almost done, it might sound like a mundane task to start all over trying to add all these references. Uh, but it will, it will save you a lot of work after you have graduated because you're still going to rely on your dissertation and you're going to do publications from there. And if you're going to do that, then having a reference manager might be a very smart way to go. So the time you spend using that, time you spend building that might not be in vain after all. So I strongly recommend that for all of us um, as a way of avoiding plagiarism. Um, Dr. Tamanja, I think at this point, I'm, I will just have to end and then ask for people to ask questions and give contributions because I'm seeing a lot of my colleagues around um, who can also put in a word and then we can make it um, a good presentation. So thank you very much uh, for uh, staying tuned in spite of all the interruptions and uh, um, I'm looking forward to your questions and contributions. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so very much, Doc, for your insightful presentation. My students are already saying so many things and some might be requesting yeah. if we can this oh, yeah. for them. But yeah, the can be I think uh, it has been very insightful for mm -hmm. not only the student but also colleagues who are also watching you yeah. give this insightful uh, presentation. Dr. Yeah. Samanja, yes, can this session be repeated? Uh, that is what most of the, most of the yes. students are saying. Yes, the students are yeah. asking that question. <laughs> I think the, the organizing team will discuss that. We'll we'll see that. If, okay. if we can repeat it because the schedule has been planned for some time and people have also programmed it into their program yeah. so we will discuss with them and see how we can possibly repeat it that's, yes. that's fine but i think some of the students have raised some few concerns okay oh just go ahead i want to just show some this part where the links are yeah, some of them are asking whether the reference manager mm -hmm. is a paid for software or free. Okay. Or I think you have explained that. Yes, um, I, I would just add that some of them are paid for. If you're using Mendeley, it's paid for. And that is why I recommended Zotero because that one is free. So if you're going with Zotero, it's free. But other ones, you have to pay for that. Okay, Prof, I think this one, somebody's asking whether the School of Graduate Studies can procure a plagiarism checker as it is done in UCC. I don't know if we already have yes, one. Yes, 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 Tamanja, the School of Graduate Studies had been very proactive. We wrote to management last year mm -hmm. to procure a plagiarism checker. And... Uh, I think I checked from the librarian and uh, it's still in progress. Mm. So we have already requested for that. Okay. But there are free ones, you know, so there are free uh, mm. plagiarism checkers, uh, yeah. which, you know, we can get. And uh, I think the best thing is that, uh, you know, I know that some universities, they give it to the students. The students have it. Whatever you write, you check. You make sure that thirty percent of your write-up is, uh, is, is, is the plagiarism. You know, thirty percent, not more than that. And then 
uh, you send it to your supervisor or whoever, and then he can check also to make sure that it is fine, you know, yeah. at least 30%. And that's it, you know, because I think it will help the students to to really be up, up to date on what they are doing, not not uh, unintentionally, you know, um, you know, quote somebody who, I mean, or uh, use somebody's uh, 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 proposition or, or, or statements as their own, you know. So I think it's it's very important, you know, if we get pregnancy checker, you know, for, 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 for the university and for all the students, the students will be asked to, to actually use them, you know, in every uh, project work or right. activity, and they have to write up something for the for 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 their lecturers and so on. But I think that uh, this is this is uh, uh, it's, it's very good, you know. And as I just want to add my voice to what the students are saying, but I think that what we need to do is to have, you know. Um, uh, the the PowerPoint presentation as a lecture, you know, mm -hmm. and then a workshop, you know. Yes. That's where yeah. we take the students through, you know, through. systematically go through that, you know. I think all the students will be, will, will be happy to have that, you know, because to save yeah. them time and, and everything. So yeah. if we can organize it in that way, that would be perfect for them. Okay, we will discuss and see how soon we can possibly arrange that workshop mm -hmm. so that at least they don't forget from what they have, uh, they have learned today. Yeah. So yeah. We can we'll look at it and see how possible we can arrange that. Uh, hopefully, uh, there won't be any interruption, internet interruption. Interruption, <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> First of this. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe you may have to go that day. You may have to go to the ICT department where um, we will not have this fluctuation. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually hoping that we can actually do a face to face session where people come with their laptops and then we guide them through installing and then doing their very first uh, uh, downloads and stuff like that. So if that becomes possible, that would be great because if they yeah, are watching. I if they are watching and trying to do it, they might they might lose track. And so no, but that's the order of the day now. Now we <laughs> are in a situation where we cannot avoid, you know. Avoid, yeah. You, yes, no. So let's go through that. <laughs> yeah. you know, and see. And many, of, many of the participants are not, they are very far from anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. If, if so, we have a place where the internet, if we have a place where the internet will be stable, then it can so, help. It, it can be done. Yeah, it yes. can be done. We can, okay. we can work on that. Okay. All right. So yeah. I think that that okay. seems to minimize some of the concerns that the students are having. Yeah, yeah. But somebody is asking whether it is always reliable, whether plagiarism <laughs> checkers are always reliable. You can trust it. <laughs> Hello, Doc. You know, I, I know some students have plagiarism checkers, checkers. At, at least. I can count of about five students I have been supervising who have. But what I noticed is that mm. at certain points, it cannot take, if the work is too voluminous, it cannot take yeah. them all. Yeah. And they have to survey them or cut them in bits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, then they have to change the uh, plagiarism checker. Uh -huh. Yes, because uh, I mean, I know, you know, if I have any pages, you can do that. No, without any problem. Small version. Yeah, Prof, I, I think it comes with a subscription. If you are using the yes. free version, then it limits you to a number of pages. Yes. Uh -huh. But if you want to pay, then it's limitless. And so they probably are using the free version. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But if the investor buys it, and because this is, this is uh, a very important thing. Important. You know, it's an area that uh, we've not been looking at carefully uh, and it will help the students and it will help the university you know so um, I think these are good you know for all of them yeah yeah but thank you so much I think uh, you know we've gonna done a good job even though there was a long lapse of a uh, silence <laughs> you know <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. what is you know, you know and bringing this in 
I think it's really great for the students to help them. You know. Yeah. Somebody's uh, dog. Yes, Dr. Somebody is asking whether his or her citation should be put for my peer reviewed <laughs> peer reviewed journal or papers with DOC or can I, can or I can use any general paper. No, when, when referencing any source at all that you got the information from, you have to reference it. Even if it's a movie that you watch and you got the idea, you have to reference. And if you consult the APA guideline, it will tell you how to reference a movie, how to reference a, a reading from a blog, for example, news reports. We reference everything. So it's not only academic writing, except that in academic writing, we don't rely so much on non-academic writing. Uh, but there are instances where you might need to reference some news reports, where you might need to reference some movies that have been produced. For all those, you have to still reference them. We are only hoping that your entire work will not just be a blog post that you're referencing. We still want to see some of the peer-reviewed articles and books in there. But if it calls for you to um, use a source other than non-academic writing, you still have to reference it. I think what they just need to know is how to reference from which source that you are picking from. If it is from, from an, if it's from, if it's from an unpublished source, source. it's the way that you can, that you can reference it. So. so, so I will refer you to the APA guideline. If you just Google and get an APA guideline, it will tell you how to reference from an unpublished source. If we mean to go through all of that, we might need like 10 sessions to just go through mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But there again, that's where technology is helpful. Once you store it in your, your, um, your reference manager, then your reference manager will do it the appropriate way for you. You don't have to struggle about that one. Once you tell it it's a film, it's just, it will reference it appropriately by the standard. Okay. So uh, I think it has been one of the successful presentations that we have had. Yeah. And I have personally enjoyed it. Although there have been some challenges with uh, technology, but of course, these are things that are outside our domain and your domain. Yeah. So we will, we will consider the students' request and see how we can possibly have uh, maybe a practical session. session. But sure. if, 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 on the other hand, we can edit this one and it is audible enough, we can put it, we can uh, present it for them to download and then follow. So we'll yeah. have a discussion after today and see the possibility and the way forward. Um, so, I, I, I think a workshop session will be better because I still skipped a lot of things. And so if they get just this one, they might just still be confused. Uh, so let's plan for a workshop session and then we can take our time to go through the steps to get a couple of them at least successful at doing it and then we'll be good. Okay, yeah. no problem. So uh, when we when we get the, the right date, the date that we can do that, we will communicate to the student leadership so that they can inform their colleagues. So yeah. and let, let me thank you briefly for the time that you have spent with us and then uh, congratulate you for wonderful work done. Absolutely, that is why we are here to support our students. Yeah. And then I will call on uh, the director of the School of Graduate Studies to say a word, and then Professor Anna Mohamensa can give a concluding remarks, and then we will end this session. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tamanja. The Prof. Can come. Yes, sir. Thank you, yes, Dr. Tamanja, the coordinator, for giving me the platform. Uh, on behalf of the School of Graduate Studies and on behalf of the graduate students, I say a big thank you to Dr. Adam Nunkum for that wonderful presentation. Uh, as the session progressed, most of the students were, were asking, shall we have this session again? Yeah. <laughs> shall we have this again? Which is an indication yeah. of the usefulness or the essence of, of, of the session? Yeah. And and I'm excited that having discussed this, we have agreed that 
there we, we shall have workshop sessions so that students get hands-on experience about some of these things. I did say in the beginning that for me in the academia it's a learning process and we have yeah. learned a lot. So thank you so much, Dr. Adam Nunkum. Thank you, Prof. Do, yes. <coughs> Dr. Tavanja, please, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. On coming and the uh, dean of graduate students. Uh, maybe if Prof. Anama Mensa would want to say some concluding words to the participants of this session. Oh, oh, um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm just uh, hoping that uh, uh, more graduate students will you know, avail themselves for such uh, uh, interactions. Uh, because even though you have supervisors and so on, not all of them, you know, will be able to guide you, you know, in details, you know, about what you should do and so on and so forth. Uh, you have uh, um, a number of uh, uh, expert researchers and so on who are presenting, uh, you know, aspects of what needs to, you need to know as a foundation for your work. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, this is something that will help each and every one of them. You know, um, when we did this at the very, you know, years ago, you know, um, we thought that this was something that we should take up and then do, but uh, opportunity did not come and we did not have the support from many people. You know, uh, a lot of people thought we were taking up their job, you know, uh, which was not the case. You know, uh, our interest is really building a strong foundation, you know, for research in the university. You know, go to any other universities, the universities that are at the, you know, very top in, 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 the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, classification, you know, Research is uh, the major issue, you know. Teaching, yes, is there, but teaching without research is really not helpful. So um, uh, I think that this should be uh, something that uh, should never end in the university. So the university should continue, and students should be made available, you know. This should be made available to the students and to the faculty in general, you know. Uh, once the faculty is also, you know, aware of what is happening. They can use that as a means to support their students. You know. So um, I think uh, for you, the students, you are uh, you are in a different age now. Uh, we didn't have this, you know, going on for those who have passed on. Uh, but now you are in a different new normal that provides you with uh, some basic skills to support and help you, you know. And uh, the university will be stronger, you will be stronger, Ghana will be stronger, Africa will be stronger, you know. Uh, and that's what we want, you know. We want to see Africa, you know, uh, being quoted all over the place, you know. And as you quote people, have I said it in the other one, you know, when we did the literature review, you know. I mentioned that why not cite people in, 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 in Africa, in your institution, in, in, in other parts of Africa? Why do you always want to, you know, uh, cite people in, in Europe and so on? You know, uh, uh, it's because of what we have been made to believe, you know, that we, we only produce raw materials for them. Just are sending our cocoa there for them to, you know, uh, refined for us. So it's the same story, you know. So uh, academicians produce things and then we use their theories to explain what the complexity of our situation is. And sometimes that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help, you know. Our complex situation, you know, we know it better than, you know, those who are outside, you know. So uh, just, just to encourage the students that they should come up with something, not always depending on <laughs> You know, for support. So, um, and once, once again, thank you, uh, Richardson, for, for the brilliant uh, presentation. And uh, 
I think the practical component will be very, very useful for students because that's what they need. The theories are there, yes, yeah, fine, but they need <laughs> hands-on, you know, activities that will really uh, make them, you know, acquire the right skills and be able to, you know, move forward with it. Thank you. And thank you, the Dean of Public Studies and everyone, you know, for coming. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Prof, for your concluding remarks. Uh, I think for the students, we will communicate to you when we will run the practical session. It will be useful to do it soon so that you don't forget what we have gone through today. So in a, in a week or two, we will communicate and see when that can be done. But I'm sure it will be done this month. So thank you so much for participating and then thank you doc so much for your excellent presentation god bless you all see you next week